Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. And if it's your first time here, I'm Janetta, an author who loves to draw. On my channel, I focus on combining storytelling with art. If that's something you're interested in, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Let's get to it. Chapter 35. It was almost eight months since Dante took a bullet trying to save Brooklyn, and five months since she selected Hunter over him. He was frustrated as hell over the current state of his life. Brooklyn was no longer an option for him. Her decision continued to eat away at him. Having Lang as his roommate again, so they were sure Kane was indeed dead, wasn't helping his emotional turmoil. They ate together, talked before bed, and watched movies together. All the things he could have been doing with Brooklyn. Since his opportunity with Brooklyn was lost because of the job, Dante now understood on an entirely new level what Lang had gone through when her husband was killed. His situation wasn't as life-altering as Lang's had been, but it was devastating nonetheless. Like Lang, his heart hadn't really been into the job since he lost the love of his life. His mind still hadn't fully processed that she chose a hunter. It had him distracted and off-kilter. Lang had taken a leave of absence for work to focus on trying to track Kane down. It disturbed Dante that no one admitted to shooting down Kane's helicopter which suggested that Kane was on the loose under a new alias. Between cases, Dante followed up on Lang's leads. Only when he knew that Kane was no longer a threat could he make the necessary changes that would have Brooklyn realize that he meant what he said about altering his life for her. If he could just find out who had sent the disc to his office back when Lang was at the safe house, that could be the break that they needed to track Kane down. Grabbing his coat to leave for a meeting one morning, he said, Can I ask you something? Lang stood next to the sink, taking her last sip of coffee. What's wrong? I was just wondering if this career is worth our personal lives. Look, you and I both know we're not ready to leave the job. She placed the empty cup into the kitchen sink. How many times have I said I was leaving, then found an excuse to push back the deadline? You think Brooklyn was right? Dante glanced at his watch. They needed to leave soon. You had a chance to be with her years ago. You decided that it was in her best interest if you didn't become a couple. Putting her rugger into her holster and sliding her jacket over it. Don't be upset with her for doing the same. Whatever. He grabbed his car keys. We got to get going. Don't mistake the messenger for the blessing. What? What? Dante stared at her as if she was crazy, then did a final glance around the townhouse before heading to the door. Lang walked through the door. I'm saying that some people enter our lives to deliver a blessing, not to be the blessing. They aren't meant to share a lifetime with us. This is a conversation for another time. Dante locked up and they headed out of the building. Besides, what she and I had was very special. Lang smiled. I know. She made you believe that you could actually have love in your life and that you didn't have to. Let's not. No, you brought it up. So we're going to talk about it, she said as they got into the truck. I've been where you are, only I married my Brooklyn. My first marriage was an amazing disaster. I still love him to this day, but it takes more than love to make a relationship go the distance. They buckled up and Dante started the truck and pulled off. Brooklyn and I aren't, listen, listen, what I'm saying is that in this moment, you can't see yourself ever resenting Brooklyn, but I know from experience that it's a real possibility. Dante cut his eyes over at Lane. The look on her face let him know she was not going to drop the subject. What happened to you and your first husband? You rarely mention him. Let's just say he made me a better wife for my second go around. There's a difference between compromise and giving up who you are to make it work. We wanted different things, and while we made it work for a while, it eventually imploded. But that's a conversation for another day. Dante maneuvered through the traffic, watching their surroundings for anything suspicious. In your second marriage, you made the decision to give up the job to have a family. So how was that different from me giving my job up to be with Brooklyn? Because... Lang paused to glance at her watch and look at the traffic. We had more going for us than just love. We work well as a team, and he understood that I might not be cut out for a full-time mother role. 
Since we'd established, I'd give it a try for a year. It felt more like a leave of absence than giving up my career. Dante knew it would have been difficult for him to transition to a new job, but he was willing to do it. It wasn't like Brooklyn had asked him to. The frustration came in not having the opportunity to at least try. He hated that Hunter was an option for her. If there was no Hunter, he could have convinced her to at least give it a try. He rubbed his temples, which did nothing to stop the tension headache he felt coming in. Weaving in and out of traffic, he said, Look, let's save this conversation for another time. We need to be concerned about why, after all this time, Aaron wants to see us. By the time they arrived at the meeting place, Dante was rethinking his decision to meet this Aaron character without notifying his team. Was the information Aaron claimed to have on Kane worth taking such a risk? He sat in the last booth with his back to the wall, pretending to look over his menu while watching everyone that came through the front door. Lang sat at the counter, ordering coffee, and keeping an eye on the area where the staff entered and exit. As the waitress came over to take Dante's order, a lanky, curly-haired guy walked over to the booth. Dante motioned for him to take a seat, the smile up at the waitress as he said, Could you give us a minute? He placed the menu in front of Aaron. Aaron sat down and put an envelope on the table. Mrs. Holder said Tuck wanted you to have this. Dante opened the package. It looked like three movie DVDs were inside. Aaron instructed, once you load a disc into your computer, use the top number on the disc label for your account number and the bottom number as your pin, just like the last time I received mysterious DVDs. Two of them are from Tuck, Aaron continued. Have you looked at them? Dante asked, wondering if those two discs were copies of the ones that had led him to Kane's warehouse. I haven't. Hopefully, you'll figure out why this information is important enough for Kane to take on Alec Muneer's alias and send his wife into Tuck's company to retrieve it. Aaron looked at his watch. Dante touched the third DVD. What about this one? <clears throat> That's from Miss Holder. And no, I haven't seen it. She said it was extremely important to check them out within the next two hours. Aaron stood and headed out of the cafe. Lang left out shortly behind him. Dante started the timer on his watch. He paid his bill for the coffee, then exited the cafe. Lang was already in the truck with her laptop out by the time he arrived. You need to follow Aaron. I was watching him as he got in his car. When he pulled off, it looked like a black sedan pulled off with him. Lang looked back. See that silver car that just crossed the light? Dante spotted it through his side mirror. That's him, she said. The black sedan is stuck at the red light. Dante handed Lang the DVDs as he did a U-turn in the direction Aaron was headed. Lang recognized the tracking number that started with TAIV at the top of two of the DVDs. This has got to be the information that Kane was after from Chuck's vault, Lang reported. She inhaled deeply and placed one of the discs in her laptop as Dante tried to keep up with Aaron, who was weaving in and out of traffic. By the way he was taking yellow lights, Dante assumed Aaron knew he was being followed. Lane gasped, and when Dante looked over at her, her mouth had dropped open as she viewed the screen. Lane, I need you to use words. What's on it? He asked. The shock immobilized her for a moment. It, it's about Kane's foster sister. Alicia Michael is now known to the world as Miss Michelle Holder. Tuck's wife? Dante said as a real life stopped him. He took the laptop out of her hand to see for himself. When the light changed, he gave it back to her. If Megan had known this entire time that Kane was just using her to find his sister, I wonder if she would still protect him so fiercely. Lang loaded the second disc. This one contains instructions to snatch Michelle and take her to a remote facility. Dante banged his hand on the steering wheel. She's his foster sister for crying out loud. What kind of morbid fascination did this man have for her? He was now following the sedan since Aaron's car was no longer to be seen. He assumed that the sedan was too busy trying to track Aaron down again to notice that they were being followed. That's just insanity, Lang said as she placed the third disc into the laptop. Shit, she said at the computer screen. What? 
This confirms that Kane is still alive. Lane looked at Dante as they merged onto the expressway. Fourth information to a woman's voice coming through the laptop. Stop Dante mid-sentence. I'm Alicia, Kane's foster sister. He's coming for me within the next few hours. I'm at the cabin tuck and I share. Alicia paused. I'm literally a relocate into a public place like a hotel since Kane's team has hit two of my other properties. My attempt to relocate to another property not on his list will take me longer. Lane took down the address. Damn it, did this fool get a master's degree in faking his death? Alicia concluded the video with a request for them to help. Call the office and have them send a team to meet us at the cabin. Dante instructed as he stopped following the sedan and merged onto the exit ramp. Kane will not win, Lang said after she placed the call and hung up the phone. Dante nodded in agreement. There was no way he was going to give Kane a chance to disappear with Alicia or come back for Lang. Kane sat smugly in the back of the van as his elite team drove to Alicia's location. The final address on his list. He thought, if this works out, I'll leave Miss Megan riding in jail for my crimes. If things don't work out tonight and her parents don't manage to wrangle her off the charges, I will get her out. Megan's ability to track people and find dirt on them had proved to be very useful. Unfortunately for her, Megan never realized the only woman he'd ever loved was Alicia. He began to think of the counseling session where, where Alicia had told the therapist her foster parents knew something was wrong with him when they continued to catch him in her room, sitting next to her bed and when just watching her. Kane loved Alicia in a way that they could not understand. Alicia was 13 and he was 15 when his parents took her in. Her presence changed him. He needed to be in her space, to inhale her scent, to touch her skin. It didn't matter that he had to sneak into her bedroom at night to do that. At night, he would watch the stars sparkle outside her window, lying very still on the floor until he was sure she was asleep. Some nights, he just watched over her. Other nights, he caressed her thighs or her arms or touched her hair. It freaked Alicia out. She would immediately pop up and talk to him for hours until his parents would come, find him there, and kick him out. It wasn't until his parents put a lock on her door so that she could feel safe at night that he realized that her talking to him was her defense mechanism against him touching her. His parents didn't understand the depth of his love for Alicia. He was so angry when he turned 18, and his parents forced him to go away for college instead of staying near home. When he come home for break, Alicia always stayed at a friend's house. Kane remembered the time he came home without letting his parents know. He found Alicia at home making out with some boy. He went ballistic. He snatched the boy away from her, throwing him onto the floor and beating him. Alicia grabbed his arm and begged him to stop. As he was swinging to hit the boy again, Kane accidentally knocked her into the coffee table and terror filled her eyes. The boy ran off as Kane checked on Alicia. The parents were not happy with Kane, but worse than that, the way Alicia looked at him with eyes filled with fear broke his heart. He was determined to prove to her that he loved her and would never intentionally hurt her. His parents sent him back to school after talking the boy's parents into not pressing charges. When Kane came home for the holidays, Alicia was gone and his parents refused to tell him where she was. Kane did whatever it took to find her. It didn't matter what college or university she attended, he kept finding her. However, once she graduated from college, he had trouble tracking her down. He still couldn't believe his parents always worked so hard to prevent him from being with her. Well, he was coming for her now, and no one would stop him. Alicia Michael, we will be together soon, and I will prove to you that my love for you is not sick or twisted, he thought as the vehicle slowed to a stop. Kane waited for his team to signal for him to come in. This was the moment he had been waiting for. He was nervous as if he was going on his first date. When he entered the cabin, she was sitting in the living room with her back to him and two of his armed men in front of her. Alicia, I'm sorry it has taken me so long to get to you. He walked towards the chair, 
concerned that she had slimmed down so much over the years. Kane rounded the chair to find Lang sitting there. Don't be sorry, Lang said as Dante stepped out, taking out the two men standing in front of Lang. Kane grabbed Lang from the chair as more of his men came through the front door. I came too far for you to get in my way again. Lang elbowed him, sending him falling over one of the guys on the floor. Kane pulled out a gun. Lang kicked it out of his hand and hit him in the chest with all her pent-up rage. She continued to slam her fist into his body. Lang used his leg to knock Lang over. She rolled and immediately jumped up. They engaged in hand-to-hand combat. Dante continued firing at the guys coming through the door, trying his best not to shoot Lang in the process. Lang roundhouse kicks and came down to his knees. Every time he tried to get up, she slammed her fist into his face. His blood slowly trickled onto the floor. Alicia's screams pierced the air as she was being dragged out of the back room. Dante turned, shooting one of the guys that was trying to drag Alicia out the back door. Go, Lang yelled. Kane used his shoulder to hit Lang. The force knocked her to the ground. Kane started choking her. She grabbed at his arm as he cut off her air supply. Lang noticed the gun was within reach. Her fingers scraped the ground trying to reach it. As Kane tightened the grip, Lang gasped for air. She finally got hold of the gun, brought her arm up, and fired several shots. Kane's eyes buckled. He released her throat and grabbed at his wounds. Lang knocked him back onto one of his dead goons, then rolled to her knees. Gasping for air, she stood as Kane's body ceased to move. He made no sound. Are you good? Peter asked as he and several others entered the cabin. Yeah, Dante may need a little assistance. He went out the back. She walked over to confirm that Kane was dead. To her surprise, his eyes popped open. He grabbed the gun out of the dead man's hand and aimed at Lang. Lang fired a single shot to his head and said, I guess I am the one sending you to hell after all. Alicia stared at Kane's lifeless body. Is it over? Lang looked up to see Alicia and Dante. Yes, it's finally over. Lang walked over and checked Kane for a pulse just to make sure. Dante nodded for Stephen to escort Alicia out. The flurry of activity was lost on Lang as she stared at Kane's body. Dante walked over to her, wrapping his arm around her. Chapter 36 Brooklyn had lied. She had told Hunter she wouldn't do this to him. But here she was, making a liar of herself. It was hard to ignore Hunter's heartbroken look when she left his office after telling him she needed to see Dante. She couldn't apologize for what she was doing. This was her life. She had to know she was making the right decision. Life had calmed down and was starting to get some normalcy back to it. As she pulled in front of Dante's place, she could see him waiting at the top of the stairs. There were no words to describe the kind of hold this man had on her heart. Brooklyn sat in the parked car for a minute, took deep breaths, and got out. Dante smiled, watching her hips sway from side to side as she approached. Hello, beautiful. To say that I was surprised to hear from you, let alone see you after our last conversation, would be an understatement. When she reached him, he wrapped his arm around her and held an scent that was so uniquely Brooklyn. Well, you've been on my mind a lot, so. She let her words hang as she entered the door he was holding open for her. Dante led her into the townhouse. You stay on my mind, Brooke. You know that. Would you like something to drink? He asked as they entered the apartment. Yes, a glass of wine would be nice. Brooklyn took a seat on the couch. So Kane is really dead this time? She couldn't stop staring and recalling all the reasons she loved Dante as he poured the wine into the glasses. Yes, to Megan's chagrin, Kane's entire plan centered around him finding his sister, not building a life with her. Now he's gone and she's doing time. Dante handed her a glass of wine and sat down next to her. But that's not what you came here to talk about. It was creepy watching the interview with Alicia, she said, ignoring his comment. I don't understand his unnatural obsession with her. What was he going to do? Kidnap her and stare at her whenever he wanted? I just don't get it. I'm grateful for that. He took a sip of wine. 
If you can understand crazy, then we have a big problem on our hands. Dante chuckled, trying to lighten the mood. Brooklyn laughed. You are so right about that. Brooke, baby, what is it that you came to say to me? Dante took her hand. Brooklyn looked down. Dante lifted her chin up with his finger. I love you, Dante, in a way that can't be duplicated. I know we didn't have a typical or official relationship. Brooklyn took a sip of wine, breathing deeply. We had something so special in those small windows of time over the years when we were together. I wish I had taken a chance on us back then, but when Cain threatened to destroy everything we love, I didn't want to risk you ending up like Lang's husband, a casualty of the job that I do. He stood with hope shining in his eyes. It's ironic that I ended up in the midst of danger. It's ironic that I ended up in the midst of danger because of your job anyway. Brooklyn took another sip of wine, working up the nerve to say what she come there to say. I apologize for that. You can't take the credit for that. Tuck sending me the file with Kane's picture in it is what drew me into the madness. She attempted to release the death grip she had on the wine glass. As I told you before, it would have been nice if we could have discussed it and come to the conclusion together. Brooke, why are you here? Did you change your mind about Hunter? Dante put his hand on the top of her thigh to stop his nervous bouncing. Her sudden silence was killing him. Finally, she whispered, I don't really think you understood what you mean to my life. Dante set his wine on the coffee table and sat next to her. That isn't answering the question I asked you. I need you to hear me out before I answer that question. She inhaled deeply, then took another sip of wine. I'm listening. You coming in and out of my life taught me to love, encouraged me to excel, and matured me in areas necessary to have a successful relationship. However, I was obsessed with what I had with you, and I wanted to be more than just content. It still amazed her that she was here risking what she had with Hunter for a man who may not have really given up his career. Brooklyn wanted to sit her wine down, noticing for the first time there were files and a laptop on the coffee table. So are you saying you decided to love Hunter despite what you feel for me? If so, you've already made that decision. I don't understand why you're here. Brooklyn nodded at the laptop. Have you gone back to work? I'm not sure I'm going back. Dante looked as if he wished he put it up. This stuff is unofficial. Oh, Brooklyn's demeanor changed as she stared at the files. I'm asking you again, what are you trying to tell me? Have you changed your decision to be with Hunter? When we leave certain jobs, there are exit interviews to give a person a chance to speak fully about the company, positive and negative, to see if there are improvements to be made. Brooklyn knew that's not why she had come here, but those files answered the question that she'd already come here to ask. Now she knew he wasn't ready to give up his career. When we end relationships, we don't always get that. This is my exit interview, Dante Huff picked up his glass, emptied in its content, and then grabbed Brooklyn's empty glass. She rested her hand on his forearms as he tried to turn away from her with the glasses. This is my honoring our love and friendship. By breaking my heart again? Dante looked into her eyes, then shook his head as he headed to the kitchen. Brooklyn quickly followed him into the kitchen. He placed her glass in the sink, then poured more wine into his. She touched his forearm, stopping him from lifting the glass to his mouth. What I need to say to you is important. I'm saying this not to hurt you, but because I love you. Please hear me out. Damn it, Brooke, why are you slicing me open again? He sat his glass down on the counter. The pain in Dante's eyes crushed her. Brooklyn put her hand on his face. Because I want to see you happy. I want to be happy with you. Are you planning to make that happen? Dante stared at her intensely for a moment. I thought not. You're not ready for the white picket fence yet. I appreciate that you wanted to try, but if you're giving it up before you're truly ready, you will resent me in our relationship. Having trouble looking in his eyes, she shifted her focus down. Dante pulled her closer and gently caressed her arm. I wouldn't. You say that now, but I saw you in action. What you do is part of you and Lang's DNA. I don't think either one of you is ready to retire. 
Brooklyn refrained from saying that the fouls on the table proved that. We both think it's time to retire. Yeah, what you both really want is a personal life that will sustain what you do, which is why I'm here. I want to see you happy. I believe you can have that happiness with Lane. The lie rolled off her tongue easily. Brooklyn was shocked at the words that were coming out of her mouth. Nante stepped back. What are you saying? I'm asking, have you ever considered going the distance with Lane? She's a woman that can handle what you do and have your back if anyone comes after you. Words were flowing out of her mouth, but she didn't even seem to have control of them. Dante walked around her. When he reached the coffee table, he grabbed her purse. What are you doing? She asked as he stuffed her purse in her hand and turned her towards the door. It's time for you to leave. He walked past her. She stared at him as he spoke. Hunter and I may not have the intense love that you and I had, but we're better suited for each other. He doesn't have to sacrifice part of who he is to be with me. Just changing his work schedule created time for our relationship. But you will have to change your whole line of work to accommodate a relationship. I couldn't ask that of you. You were created to do this. Please go. When she wouldn't move, he circled back and escorted her to the door, then opened it. Sweetie, you don't have to give up what you do, your purpose, to have a good love. You just have to find a love that's a better fit for your life and one that can go the distance, whether you work this job 10 more years or leave it in six months. Maybe that woman isn't lame, but there is someone out there that you can go the distance with. He refused to make eye contact with her. Okay, I appreciate whatever it is that you think you're doing. Dante fought to keep his emotions in check, but it's time for you to go home. Brooklyn tried to get him to look her in the eyes, but he kept turning his head. I sincerely want to see you happy, even if we can't find that happiness together. She finally grabbed him by both sides of the face. Dante closed his eyes. You can have love and your career, just not with me. Like he told me, don't limit yourself. She wrapped her arms around him. He just stood there stiffly. Maybe this was a mistake, she thought, as a tear rolled down her cheek. Brooklyn was regretting her decision to come see him. All she did was put a dagger deeper in his heart. It was stupid of her to believe that he could actually be able to leave the job behind. Dante doing it unofficially would have just led to him lying to her in order to maintain their relationship. Her heart was breaking all over again. She knew she made the best decision for her life as well as his, even though he couldn't see it now. Brooklyn turned and walked out the door. As she hit the exterior stairs, tears were freely flowing down her cheek. She said a quick hello to Lane, who was coming up as she trotted down, trying to resist breaking into a full-fledged run. Brooklyn was kicking herself in the behind for risking her current relationship for a pipe dream. Sliding into the driver's seat, she wiped her cheeks with the back of her hands and then started the car and drove off. Brooklyn exhaled as she tried to gain control of her emotions. When she heard that Kane was dead and Dante had taken a leave from his job, she thought that maybe she needed to reevaluate her decision. Despite how much she loved Hunter, Dante's job had been the biggest reason she had chosen Hunter. She stopped at the mall to walk around and clear her head. She could see clearly that chasing a fantasy in her head had prevented her from truly appreciating the reality that she had with Hunter. She entered the food court and ordered tea and took a seat. Hunter deserved better than what she had done. She would now be more considerate of her friends than in a relationship or doing things that made her want to scream, what the hell? They were addicted to love, just like she was addicted to Dante. Now she wished she had taken time to truly get over that addiction and grieve over their relationship before pursuing something with Hunter. Hunter was an amazing man in so many ways, but like a druggie trying to recreate the feeling of their first high, she had continually compared what she felt for Hunter against what she felt for Dante. If she was honest with herself, it was the memory of what was and the unpredictability of what could be with Dante it kept things feeling intense. Brooklyn fought back the tears as she realized that she had created the problem and now had to come clean with Hunter. The idea of losing Hunter over this incident devastated her soul in a way that walking away from Dante had not. 
Part of her wanted to lie to Hunter, but she couldn't do that to him. That was not who they were in their relationship. It was her prayer that Hunter would give her another chance. If he did, she would not mess it up. Brooklyn grabbed a napkin and wiped her tears. She was so mad at herself for being stupid and hurting Hunter. When she realized how late it was, she finally got the nerve to head home. The cell phone rang. Hunter's name popped up on the display and she answered. Hey, handsome. Brooklyn rolled up to the window. I'm just calling to see what my relationship status is. Hunter's voice was overly chipper, as if he was trying to hide the torment of the waiting and wondering. Brooklyn's mind replayed asking him to push back their dinner because she needed to see Dante and promising to meet him back at his place later. Recalling his look of sheer devastation and disappointment ripped her apart. The same as it was when I left your office. She almost choked on fear that she'd lose Hunter. The thought of not ending up with either of them because she was still straddling the fence struck terror in her heart. Glad to hear that. I'm pulling into the garage. Are you still up for going out for dinner? Brooklyn parked her car and grabbed the car key, her purse and sale. She tucked the sale between her shoulder and face, then locked up and started looking for the apartment key. How about we stay in, Hunter suggested. When she entered the door, she saw two rows of rose petals leading from either side of the door to the living room. Hunter was standing there where the rose petals stopped. She smiled as she closed and locked the door. What is this? You have to come to me to find out. Hunter gave her a devilish smile as he slid his hand into his pocket. Brooklyn smiled and threw her stuff on the console table near the door. As she walked towards him, Brooklyn suddenly felt nervous. I'm listening. BK, after all the other men you dated, after all the men you love, you finally made it to me. Hunter dropped to his knee just as Brooklyn reached him and pulled out a ring box. I love you, Brooklyn, and I want you in my life forever. Hunter! Brooklyn covered her mouth as he opened the box to reveal a one-carat pear-shaped diamond set in a twisted diamond-encrusted platinum band. She squealed a little bit. Will you marry me? Hunter grabbed her hand, looking up into her eyes. She stood with her mouth open, wanting to say yes, but remember what she had done. Whatever happened at Dante's doesn't matter as long as the end result is you want to be with me. Hunter stood, sliding the ring back into his pocket. Sadness filled her face as she crossed her arms, stating, if I hadn't gone there to see if he had given up his job so I can reevaluate my decision, maybe it would be that simple, but I, listen, I'm willing to do what many good women have done for years and take that leap of faith despite what you've done. My best friend couldn't appreciate the good woman he was with because he kept running up behind his baby mama. He uncrossed her arms and held her hand. He is happily married to that good woman because she was willing to take that leap of faith. That's a beautiful lollipop and gun drop story, but your boy lucked out. Everybody's story don't end so well. Look, I'm willing to take that risk to attempt to be one of the couples that the story ends well for. You kept hidden the fact that you were going to see Dante, but you didn't. Hunter, she sighed, stepping back. Well, I don't want to lose you. Saying yes to marriage after just wavering on my decision to be with you is... Listen, Hunter interrupted. If seeing Dante one last time has helped you finally accept that I'm indeed the man for you, then I still want you in my life as my wife. He paused. But you do realize from this moment forward... Dante can't be in your life in any shape, form, or fashion, right? Yes, Brooklyn nodded to confirm her answer. People may think I'm crazy for proposing to you after you visit your ex, but I believe in us. Hunter gazed down at her. The only person's opinion that I care about is yours. Okay, she smiled as he descended to his knee again. So Brooklyn, will you be the recipient of a special kind of love that believes no matter what anyone else thinks, that we have what it takes to create a great partnership. He took out the ring box and opened it again. Will you take the leap of faith and team up with me to be one of the few happily married? I'm so sorry for ever doubting what we had. Yes, Hunter Torres, I would love to marry you. She watched as he slid the ring on her finger with tears flowing down her cheek. Brooklyn pulled him up into a hug. 
In that moment, she realized she almost gave up getting the 80% of what she needed in her life by chasing the 20% she didn't have. As Hunter lowered his lips to hers, Brooklyn decided to never let him regret taking this chance on her. Now that she was fully committed to her decision to be with Hunter, she was determined to make sure it stayed that way. Dante was not a part of her past that she had to let go of in order to grab hold of a bright future with Hunter. He ended the kiss and tears rolled down Brooklyn's face as she silently promised to spend the rest of her life showing Hunter how much she loved him. Hunter wiped away her tears and said, I love you too, as if he heard her thoughts. Brooklyn wrapped her arms around him, holding him tightly and feeling like the luckiest woman in the world. Hope you enjoyed today's story. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Until next time, be and stay blessed.